Good evening, everybody. Thank you for braving this um, summer-like weather we're having. Um, my name's Kevin Jennings. I'm president of the Tenement Museum, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our second annual LGBTQ Pride Month event. Uh, featured tonight, Adafi Akporo and John Washington talking about the experience of LGBTQ refugees here in New York City. Um, this is our second annual event focused on this topic because the Tenement Museum is dedicated to telling the stories of immigrants, migrants, and refugees here in New York City and beyond as part of fulfilling our vision of a nation that embraces and values the contributions of immigrants, migrants, and refugees to the ongoing American story, including LGBTQ immigrants, migrants, and refugees. Adafi Akporo is a Nigerian LGBT writer and activist who fled his home country in 2016 because of a threat to his life for identifying as an LGBT person. In 2017, Adafi authored the book Bed 26, a memoir of an African man's asylum in the United States. He currently lives in New York City and works as director of the RDJ Refugee Shelter, the only shelter for LGBTQ asylum seekers in New York City. Interviewing him will be John Washington. John is a freelance journalist who writes about immigration and border politics as a contributor for The Nation and The Intercept. He is currently working on the new series Migrant Voices, which is an oral testimony project for, from The Nation that amplifies a variety of immigrant voices. His first book, An Exploration of the Concept of Asylum, From Ancient Greece to the Era of the Trump Administration, is forthcoming from Verso Books in the spring of 2020. So be on the lookout from that, and we'll be sure to stock it downstairs in our bookstore where after this um, talk tonight there will be a reception so please come downstairs and join us for a little of uh, wine and cheese to celebrate pride month um, and also we are proud to be one of the sites displaying the names project quilt as part of the stonewall 50 celebration which you will see downstairs during the reception immediately following tonight's event and just a little advertisement, our next Tenement Talk will be a week from Thursday, June 20th, in honor of World Refugee Day. In addition to being um, LGBT Pride Month, June is Immigrant um, Heritage Month and World Refugee Awareness Month. And we will be celebrating the uh, topic of immigrant and refugee economic entrepreneurship. In case you don't know, over half of the businesses in this city are started and run by immigrants. So we'll be celebrating that a week from Thursday with a tenement talk focused on that subject. But now on to tonight's LGBTQ Pride program. Take it away, John. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here, everyone. And great to be sitting with you again, Adafe. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to start with some opening remarks and then uh, Idafe and I are going to chat for a little bit, I'll mostly just be asking some questions and we listen to Idafe and then we'll open it up at the end for some, some questions from you all as well. So um, let me start with a quote from Hannah Arendt and she, she wrote that what was unprecedented in the 20th century refugee crisis or crises was not the loss of a home but the impossibility of finding a new one. And I think uh, what that boils down to is that there is a scarcity or a, a meagerness, um, not of resources, but of will. Uh, and, um, you know, for, for millennia, humans have been losing their homes. But with, in the 20th century, the rise of nation states, nationalism, world wars, increasingly drawn, militarized borders, people had trouble finding homes in a new way. Um, and so today in the United States, uh, we're still accepting a few tens of thousands of refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, that number is going down. It's the lowest in 2019 um, since the refugee program began. Um, and I think that overall, the message is pretty clear. And that message, uh, you know, both projected abroad and at home is basically, you are not welcome here. Um, and and that, that comes out in the rhetoric that comes from this administration. It come, came out 
right away when this administration took office with the Muslim ban. It comes out, you know, with the political and legal attacks against transgender people serving the military. It comes out in the general reviling of people from Mexico, Central America, or what the U.S. president has deemed shithole countries. Um, the gutting of asylum protections for women fleeing domestic violence. Uh, the, the grander and sort of constant fight against asylum. Um, and, you know, for all the people who are fleeing their homes because of climate change, because of economic despoilment, because of political violence in all of its guises, or because of entrenched racism, or because of uh, intolerance for who people are, how they are, who they love, how they love them, all of it, there's this message, and it's basically a door being slammed. And yet, there's a competing message. And people like Edafe, I think, are, you know, and, and, and people like you all for coming to events like this or for descending to the airports after the Muslim ban, um, for opening homes, communities, places of worship, are sending this competing message. And that message is, you are welcome here. Um, and I think that hardly anyone I know, and I, I, you know, I write about this and study these topics a lot, um, hardly anyone I know both espouses and embodies that message, you are welcome here, uh, more uniquely or more beautifully than Adafe. Um, and you, you, I think you see this in so many different ways. Um, you know, he, he talked to me about, um, for this, this, this when I interviewed him and then got to know him a little bit after that as well, um, his, his work as an activist and organizer in Nigeria, uh, both with around clean water and like helping to bring health consciousness to overlooked areas and communities, to the gay scene in Nigeria, um, to his will and fortitude in detention, which after uh, his play that he performed and acted in, there was literally a line of people that were standing up to tell him how much he meant to them, how his story in detention still means to people today in detention. They point at what was formerly his bed. Um, and, you know, and, and now also as a writer and a speaker and a, an actor, um, <laughs> all, all of these things, you embody embody and espouse that message. Um, there, there's, there's one more quote I want to bring up, and um, I think it's in conversation with the Arendt quote that I started with. And it comes from uh, Sam Chris and um, Ali O. May Hagen, and they're two British journalists, and they're writing about the uh, refugee crises around climate change. And they, uh, they write that um, th the problem is not a overabundance of humans, but a dearth of humanity. And I, I, I really respect their work, and I admire it. But I also think that they're wrong. I think that we have the humanity. Uh, we have the tools, and we have the heart. We just need to use it. We just need to apply it. And I think that's what Adafe is doing through the shelter that, that you know, we've already heard about a little bit. Um, through, again, going back to Nigeria, like organizing these, these gay ballroom dance parties that were also... HIV testing parties. Um, so, you know, I could go on and on, um, but what I want to do is, is, is ask you about your experience there, um, how, how, how your work, your activism, your organizing in Nigeria, um, w what you were doing, and, and how eventually that work led to your needing to flee Nigeria. Thank you very much, John. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. A lot of people, always think that it is the responsibility of gay people to fight for gay rights. And that is a misconception because when I started activism, it has nothing to do with gay rights. It started with the community I was posted to for NYSC. Like, you know Peace Corps in America, when you graduate, they post you to another place to go and serve. So in Nigeria, there's a service called National Youth Service Corps. 
So if you graduate from a particular state, you'll be posted to another state that has nothing to do with your tribal people for you to learn new culture and mix with other people. So I was born in Southern Nigeria, where predominantly Christians. So I was posted to Northern Nigeria. And in Northern Nigeria, they are predominantly Muslim. And most of the women are not allowed to work, mostly men. And these women have low standard of education because they are not allowed to have education. And I have a degree in food science and technology. So I was posted to a school of health technology to help teach about nutrition and chemistry. So while I was teaching in the school of health technology, we were, we were meshed with a general hospital, the only clinic in the entire village. I was sick, I had typhoid fever. When I was taken to the clinic, I discovered that typhoid fever was caused by drinking bad water. So I was like, this is curable, because I studied food science and technology. By just boiling the water and filtering the water, a lot of people's life will be saved. But as a man living in a Muslim-dominated state, I cannot go into somebody's apartment without their husbands being around. So this was the first form of advocacy I did. I went to the markets and I was telling people that I want to organize a lecture for you guys to come and learn about how to make portable drinking water. While I was doing this, they reported me to the chief in the community that I'm trying to sleep with, the, with their wives and their children, that I'm trying to lure the female students to sleep with them. And this was when I said that I am gay. <laughs> I have no interest with these women. My interest is for them to have clean drinking water. But I cannot say that I am gay in public because I will be killed. So I organized the girls in my class to go and train the women on how to preserve clean drinking water. This is what they call peer education. So I did it for some time. When I left this village and moved to Abuja, I discovered that peer education was a form whereby gay people who are, who are out a little bit can train other gay men who are not out on education about HIV. And HIV is a predominant, it was prevalence in Nigeria because of, Nigeria was the second highest prevalent country for HIV. So my work then was educating some few gay men that were a little bit out to go and train the ones that are DL on <laughs> how to use condoms. So this work led to me being called an activist. I never knew what is the meaning of the word activist, even till I came to America, that I knew that an activist is anybody who is trying to create change. So my work in Nigeria was basically trying to educate people on how to do something differently. And I was writing this morning, while I was writing on the piece of paper, something came to my mind, that people who decide to do the work of creating change basically do not choose to do that work. That work choose them based on experience, based on exploration, or some other circumstances that happen in their life. For me, it was the government of Nigeria passing a law that criminalizes same sex by 14 years imprisonment. And I was like, although I'm HIV negative, there are a lot of people who are HIV positive, they could not speak for themselves. And HIV is always associated with the gay community because they feel like, if they can demonize people with HIV, the gay community is an easy target. It was the same thing in America, the same thing in other parts of the world. That if gay men are demonized, they will run into hiding, and this will increase the prevalence of HIV. And me one day might sleep with someone that is HIV positive and is not on treatment, and I too will become HIV positive. So I do not choose to become an activist or to be called an activist. Activism choose me based on my life experiences. And yet, and yet, uh, you eventually, even in Nigeria, you started identifying more as an activist. I mean, when you maybe when you were working on typhoid, less so. But once you moved to Abuja and you were organizing the so in in yeah. Abuja is a metropolis in Nigeria, and most gay people were persecuted in villages always run to the city because there's power in numbers. And if you could gather together in a particular, there's like what they call the pressure bubble. If you are a gay person and you are in a particular place that there's no other person like yourself, you would think that you are demonized. 
It has happened to everybody that are gay, that are in a particular place. I fought with myself. Like with, I was a very strong Pentecostal Christian. And I'm asking myself, how can I be gay? And I love God, and I want to preach the gospel, and things like that. But when I came to Abuja, it was actually the first time I saw people being able to live their true self, even with the midst of everything that they are going through. That when you come into the gay ballroom scene, that like maybe you guys are here, on the ground is a party whereby people can come with their clothes and change on the ground and to be able to be themselves. On the surface level, in so many places, people would say that gay people do not exist, but they were on the ground. So I think that being able to provide a safe space qualify you to be called an activist because people who you are creating this space for see you as a true representation for that community. And I think that that was what I was trying to do, and that is why people identify me as an activist. The major situation that made me left my country was a series of attack. Because if you are able to live your true life, people who want to be able to live that true life, and they are not able to taste it, they hate it. If you are drowning, you cannot be a good lifesaver because you are halfway dead. If somebody said, save another person, you will be struggling to save yourself before you save another person. Because I realize that this is who I am, and nothing can change me from being who I am. How I'm able to discover that being gay is nothing evil is because I have been on the both side of being someone that demonizes people for being gay and being someone that advocates for people for being gay. I'm not, I'm, I'm not ashamed of saying that I demonize gay people. Because when I was growing up in the neighborhood I grew up in, there was nobody visibly that was gay. If you grew up in Saudi Arabia, there's 99.9% .9 chance that you will become a Muslim. It's not by choice. Some people grow up being racist, but they discover that being racist is not something that is good, and they change. And that was me. I would grow up a predominantly Pentecostal Christian, and I believed that being gay was evil. But when I came to Abuja and I saw people living their true life, I was like, this long life, I can't be able to drag myself all through it, pretending to be something that I am not. So I came out as gay first to myself by screaming that, God, I am gay. I ran on the field and said, I am gay. Just to relieve and to be able to say that word freed me a lot of head space to be able to advocate for other people who I see struggling to get to that point where I've been able to get to. And by doing that, that was what led to the persecution I faced in my country. Because in Nigeria, both Christian and Muslim religion is, has taught us to believe that being gay is something that is Western and foreign. So I, I faced persecution for what I wear, how I talk, Oh, why are you carrying that bag? It's a unisex bag. I tell them that people in Europe, men and women carry this bag. They're like, this is not Europe. This is Nigeria. And people ask me, why don't you have a girlfriend? You have been staying in this place for 12 months. Nobody is coming to visit you. It was first word of mouth, like, why are you dressing like this? Why are you talking like this? Then it led to the organization I was working in, because the organization provides access to HIV treatment for gay men. People would be like, oh, why are you going into that office? Because people that go into that place, they behave like women. Oh, you must be gay. So the persecution grew from verbal abuse to like physical abuse. And one of the abuse was very severe that I thought I was going to die. Like, they kidnapped me. And they took everything I had, stripped me naked, beat me up. And they said that they were even going to report me to my family, took pictures of me in nude, trying to blackmail me just because I was open enough to leave my true identity. So after I advocated for gay men for some time, I said that if I was going to leave, it wouldn't be in Nigeria because the persecution has gotten to this place. And this is something that is evidence that I want you all to know, that I do not choose to come to America, that if I have a choice, I told everybody, I will remain in Nigeria. I miss my family. 
I had a master's in Nigeria. I have a good quality of education. Although my life in America is better than my life in Nigeria, but everything I grow up knowing change within the twinkle of an eye. Who we choose, people even in America that still have perception that gay people do not deserve to live. And I will ask this question over and over again. You have seen gay people. If you have not seen any, I am gay, let me start with that. What have I done to you since I sat in this place? But most of you, I'm preaching to the masses. In my country, people like my mom would not persecute another gay person, knowing that Edafe is openly gay. And that is something I am proud of, that I am able to survive the trials and tribulation in my own country and come to this country and still create visibility for people back home in Nigeria. Like publishing my book, Bear 26, when I was growing up, I never saw anything about being gay. No videos, no pictures, nothing. And I'm always wondering, is it really true that gay people exist? Or I'm living in a fantasy world? Or am I really possessed? And how can I be cured from this demonic spirit? And whenever you are able to turn from right to left, it's hard to return back to right. So, I was a right conservative Christian that was pushing against myself when I realized that I had to cut myself slack and be able to be myself because I've tried to change myself and I cannot change myself. It has made me to want to preach to other people too that you should also consider what kind of closet you are into. People are in different kind of closets. And you might not be able to open up from your closet because of the environment, people, time, and place at that particular time. Some people are diabetic. Some people have cancer. They cannot open to their family. They hide it. And by doing so, you can't find people who will love you, people who you trust that will support you. And when I'm able to come out, I want to be to those people that representation of somebody that you could trust, somebody that you could see. Although it led to my displacement, but that was one of the most fulfilling things that has ever happened in my life. Well, there's a, a lot to, <laughs> to, digest, to, to digest there. Um, I wonder, I have a couple of questions. You know, when you're talking about like some of the organizing they were doing in Nigeria, um, it was underground, like literally underground, but also you couldn't be in the open for a couple different reasons. And you explained that, you know, you yourself, uh, you know, received abuse or kidnapped and, and beat up. But there's, and, and those are from private actors, but there was also on the books currently in Nigeria, um, could, could you explain a little bit of, of the, what currently is law uh, about um, gay rights in Nigeria? So in 2014, this built from 2013. In March 2013, the government of Nigeria passed a health discrimination bill that people who identify as gay or LGBTQ cannot be able to access health care. But like, it was kiss and don't tell. Nobody knew who was gay or not. But in 2014, the government of Nigeria passed a law that criminalizes same-sex marriage by 14 years imprisonment. That is marriage inside and outside of Nigeria, between same cells, will not abide in Nigeria. Then amorphous show, amorous or amorphous show of public affection. That is, if I and John hold our hands and walk on the streets, we could be persecuted for being gay. That is amorphous. Civic cohabitation, two people living in an apartment that are of same cells, that look like they're having same-sex relationship can be persecuted 10 years imprisonment. Activists, organizations that provide safe, safe space. Like if we are all men gathered here, we can all be persecuted for 10 years imprisonment. Healthcare facilities, anything that has to do with same-sex can be persecuted for 10 years imprisonment. When this law was passed, there was a rise by both states and non-state actors. Because you can't be able to voice out something like, oh, I'm not gay. But the law says that a more first show of public affection can be. Although nobody has been persecuted by the law yet, but this has caused a high rise of mob, mob 
jungle justice, mob attack, and police blackmailing people. You know, there's this app they call Grinder. If you are working in Nigeria and police stop you and search your phone because you look like gay, I don't know how gay people look, but, and the police search your phone and they see the Grinder app on your phone, you have to pay or they will take you to the police station. They didn't catch you for doing anything with same sex. On your phone, if there's a picture of a man that has his body open, you are gay. Or a woman that has a picture of a woman, you are gay. And you can be persecuted by the police. So the police practice extortion and blackmail of LGBTQ people. In addition to that, the police ask people to tip them information about gathering of organizing like I used to do, whereby we organize parties for people to be able to get tested for HIV. People will come to that party and tip off information to the police to come and raid the party. Recently in Lagos, Nigeria, 57 suspected gay men were arrested. These were people that were in an underground party. And now I'm laughing because when I have anxiety, I laugh. It's not that I'm just having fun. Now, people who were in that party, one of them outed himself because when the police arrested them, he said, I'm HIV positive. And instead of them to think about his treatment as an HIV positive person, the next question they're asking him in, in front of national TV, how did you get HIV? And this guy get to out his mother. It was like, it was from mother to child. I, I didn't know how I got HIV. When they gave birth to me, they told me I have HIV. And this guy now is facing discrimination from community because people think that HIV positive people can infect them basically from touching. And this guy now, because he's effeminate, is living in a safe house. In the safe house where he's living, there are other gay people and some of them are HIV positive there. One of them sent me a message, I think it was on Tuesday, that one of the guys in the safe house is about to die because he doesn't have access to medication. The guy is afraid to go to a clinic because if he goes to the clinic, the nurse will say, how did you have uh, this HIV? Are you gay? Do you have people to f allow people to have sex with you in your ass? Such kind of embarrassment from both police, healthcare providers, makes it difficult for people to live in a country like Nigeria. And it's not just in Nigeria. In 80 plus countries, Things like this happened. Recently in Russia, we saw people being engraved on their chest gay. Basically, for nothing that has to do with the people that are perpetrating such kind of hate crime and violence. So LGBTQ people all across the world still suffer persecution for the right to be who they are. In seven plus countries, gay people are punishable by being stoned to death. That means if we are saying that pride is something we should celebrate. We should think about what led to that pride. And globally, we should enforce such kind of strategies globally. If NROA is fighting for New Zealand, teaching them strategies on how to fight for gun rights, people who are free, you might think that you are not gay or anything, and people are suffering persecution all over the world, you should also think about how can we create global strategies for people to be able to have access. If it's HIV medication, if it's, because like, why talk about HIV? During the AIDS crisis in New York City, ACT UP came up. This led to other fights that also create the liberation of gay people. It could be a starting point and a penetration into the entire community. People are dying. If a disease is still Va valid in one part of the world, it will always spread to other parts of the world. Well, I mean, you, you had a creative workaround, though, right? With with your like AIDS education organization in Nigeria, because you were able to still work openly, but you just weren't allowed to say that it was for gay rights. And could you explain a little bit about how you figured that out and how we're able to keep on working? So, <laughs> in Nigeria, you can't say that you are gay because there's a law that persecute gay people by 14 years imprisonment. But we're still able to provide access to health care for gay men with few organizing, like John was making an example of, 
like five or six organizations identify as LGBTQ organizations. They provide access to services for LGBTQ people through the statement, men who have sex with men. So they don't say gay men. So people can still have treatment. It's true. The MSM, through Global Fund, they created a statement that says MSM, men who have sex with men, to be able to have access to treatment. But that is a penetration point. But the funding is so low that even the US government is cutting access to funding internationally through USAID and other organizations that provide such kind of funding to do both capacity building, access to medication, access to training, to train these people. So we can also contribute to help people in other parts of the world. A lot of people always say this, that what, um, what, is, what, is it, what is in this for me? Like, what is in this for me? America has an edge over other countries, not because we have oil, not because we have technology, not because we are the smartest people, not because we have nuclear weapon, not because of anything else, except for the ability to integrate migrants into the fabric of the society. And that is what make PISA available to all of you. And that is what make yoga a tradition. It's an India tradition. Pizza is from Italy. The clothes you wear, everything you do, is brought by migrants from different countries. And that has been the competitive edge America has had. If America closed that bridge, nothing else for America. And people are saying that if we help other people, what about ourselves? After World War II, America contributed to the Marshall Plan to help rebuild Europe, to reduce the migration of European migrants to America. And now today, Europe is what it is. When you calculate the value of the Marshall Plan funding to today, it's more than 13 billion US dollars. America is cutting funding to Honduras, Guatemala, and Venezuela, countries that are suffering persecution. They are saying that we want to protect ourselves. We were able to protect America because we were able to protect other country. If we lose that core value, we have lose what it takes to be America that the entire world see, that the entire world respect. The respect you hold is not because you have Trump in power. It's not because you have had great president like Obama that visited places and tried to create equal right for people is because Americans have been respected as people who accept and love every other people. And if America start losing that core value, what else is in America? Um, well, we've, we've been able to touch on a bit about your work in Nigeria, but I want to hear a little bit about what you're doing now. And I, I wonder maybe if you could talk about how, so, you know, from when you, not decided to, but were forced to come over to the U.S. and ask for protection. Um, you were detained for uh, five months around there. And when you got out, and I, I sort of alluded to this in, in my brief intro, when you got out, you, you not only landed on your feet, but somehow you were already sprinting. I mean, you were very quickly working for First Friends of New York, New Jersey. You were then are now a board member uh, first Friends, um, you wrote a book, you're acting a play, you r run this shelter. Like, what about your experience uh, having to flee and then in detention, do you think prepared you or somehow let you or inspired you to do all this work within two years, right? So, yeah, so they say that our struggles may either paralyze us or energize us, but my struggle would not paralyze me because of the people that made it possible for it not to paralyze me. There are so many migrants who have strengths, who are vocal, who can be visible like myself and do not have that opportunity because people, we are not there for them. If you load a picture on Instagram, if you have 10 comments within the first five minutes, that picture will have a lot of likes is the algorithm. When I came to America, I opened up myself to people, and people were there who were open 
accepting, loving, and made it possible for me to rebuild my life in this country. People in America are very good people. But on the news, if you talk about good people, nobody will read their news. A publisher once told me that the best way to sell a story is to make it very dramatic so that people will wonder how that story was made. I could tell you everything I've done in the last two years, but I'm nothing without the people who made it possible for me to get to this point. When I came to America, I got pro bono legal counsel through immigration equality. I had five lawyers that represented me. Some people stay in detention center two years without a lawyer. So although I have created works that made it easy for me to add these connections, that is why I will say this. You cannot be an invisible bridge. A bridge that is not visible is a useless bridge. Because if you're an invisible bridge, people will not be able to walk on top of you. And the reason why my work has been successful is because I create visibility for other people who are not able to be visible. I'm able to speak on behalf of LGBTQ people from Nigeria, from West Africa. I don't have knowledge about the entire place, but I'm able to stand in the gap where nobody was ready to stand in. I'm able to speak about my life experience, things that are deep and painful, so that you can understand that people are forced to flee, but they might not be able to say it because of the trauma they are going through. It doesn't mean that they are not like me. So I had people that were loving, caring, that told me that we are going to support you no matter what. You are not going to be homeless. Like, I stayed in a free apartment for three months, no rent, with a MacBook in New York City, free internet, food. Who does that? But there was a bridge that led me to that. When Christina, the lady that offered me accommodation, came to Nigeria to work in Nigeria, I didn't know I would meet her in America. She came to work in a study on the stigma of gay men as related to HIV. So she was working in my facility, and I was facilita facilitating her study by helping her with like transcribing because some people speak pidgin English, like broken English. It's difficult to understand. So I explained for her, we went to club, party, we became friends. When I was released from the detention center, she was in Baltimore when I was in Nigeria. So I told her that Christina, we're chatting on Facebook and she was like, where are you? I said, I'm in New Jersey. And she was like, what? New Jersey? When did you come to New Jersey? I was like, six months ago, I came to America. I was detained, da, 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 da. And she was like, I stay in New York City. I was like, when did you come to New York City? She was like, after my PhD, I got a job with the New York Department of Health. Come and stay with me. Fix three months. After three months, you move. You don't pay me rent, nothing. Just stay with me. Have anybody ever stayed with you before? It's hard. Because me, I am graciously organized. But when you just came out of a detention center and have not bathed with a good soap or detergent or deodorant, you smell. For somebody to allow you to sleep, eat without money, wake up anytime you want, sleep anytime you want, have a key, behave like that, it takes grace. And Christina was a bridge for me to be able to get back on my feet. Thousands of people come to this country. They need that bridge. They don't need you to be Christina to give them a place to stay. It takes averagely 10 friends for a refugee to resettle in a new country. They don't understand the language. They don't know the food. They don't know the culture, direction. I and Christina will be discussing, she'll be like, gay men in America is not like Nigeria. I work with the Department of Fair. There's a lot of STD. Be careful if you want to have sex, use condom. Just a conversation like that saved me from not having disease in New York City. Because somebody spoke to me about something I know nothing about. So this is the underlying factor that always remember this, that you cannot be an invisible bridge. There are three ways in which you can help. If you don't want to be visible because of unsolicited requests, join a donor advice fund through a visible person. 
you become a bridge to others. You are invisible, but your money becomes visible. That is one way. Secondly, you might be in any form of career, Goodman Sachs, any job you are doing, you can be a bridge to newcomers. By helping them write a grant, because their English is not so good like my English. I get grants from my organization, but I don't know how to write English. But I have a friend called Tom Otu in Boston. He's my mentor. He mentored me for like five months before I met other mentors. He helped me write grants, helped me rewrite my resume. I got jobs. I don't know how to write a cover letter. Because a cover letter in Nigeria is different from America. You can help somebody by donating your suits that you no longer find valuable. But somebody who just came here and is going for a job needs that suit. That is the second way you can be a bridge. The third way is to be a friend. Just be caring. Just have a listening ear. When you give an immigrant, a refugee, a migrant your time, you are not going to change that person's life. But you are telling that person that in the midst of everything that you are going through, that you see them, that you hear them, and you understand them, that alone will go a long way in helping somebody rebuild their life. For somebody who has nothing, something is everything. Always remember that. So it was a, a MacBook and three months of rent that... <laughs> And, and, and a lot of grace that, that let you sort of launch into your career now. And yet, right now, you're also maybe redistributing that grace a little bit at the shelter. And could you just talk maybe for a, a couple minutes about that, and then we, we'll, we'll take a few questions as well. Like, like uh, you know, I, I, I got to visit it um, <laughs> up in Harlem, but, you know, right now you're able to host how many refugees at a time, and, and, and what kind of services can you provide them? And, so I grew up in a setting that I don't know how to sell myself because like self-promotion for me was bad. But I've been learning that you have to learn how to promote yourself as a director of a not-for-profit organization. Because <laughs> we don't make profit, so if, even though we promote ourselves, all the money goes into helping people directly. So when I came to America, I discovered that housing was a big issue for migrants. Home means a lot of things to a lot of people. For me, Home was that place I slept for three months. For you, it could be anything. But for the migrants who stay in my shelter, home is the basement of a church. For somebody to stay in the basement of a church, it means that there is no other place to call home. So RDJ Refugee Shelter is a holy shelter in New York City that provides housing for asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants who are experiencing homelessness in New York City. We provide eight to 10 bed space at each particular time. I will provide transitional housing three to six months, but there are people who have stayed a year in my shelter based on their need. So what we try to do is that if an asylum seeker comes to America, they don't have social security, they are not eligible for any single benefits. So while they are in the process of application, we provide them transportation, feeding, access to legal services, because when you come to America, you don't know anything. So we do referrals to legal services and all other combined services that we are able to offer as a result of other organizations that we partner with. So what our service end with is providing a safe space for asylum seekers. If you want to know more, because I can't really explain more, you could check ROGJ or talk to me directly, because I can sell to you one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you know, um, earlier this afternoon, I, I went on a tour. Um, I, I'm spacing on the name of it, but it was uh, the the three different families who lived in in an apartment in this. Thank you, under one roof, yeah, um, which I highly recommend. But you know, just it, it reminds me, and, and hearing you again is just how much identity is wrapped up in place and specifically home, and and you know when you take that or when you from somebody or when you lose that um, how hard it is to kind of find that back and, and resettle and, and find your way and find yourself again um, and you were amazingly able to do that very quickly uh, I, I want to say something is that I said this to Kevin before I came here is that I don't yet feel at home in America because there's a conflict between if I want to go back to my country but I can't go back to my country. So if you are forced to flee your home, it's different from choosing to leave your home. 
And when you're in America, and other immigrants who have been able to integrate into America start treating you as someone that this place cannot be your home, you start feeling the, the necessity of being with people that were like you, that you miss. So I still miss that factor of like, I don't hate white people, but I hate white people that are racist. It reminds me of living in a country that is 99.9% .9 black people that we were divided based on tribe. So I, 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 I still feel that need of like, what, when will I be able to call America home? And who should decide that this place should be my home or not? If uh, you all want to ask a few questions, we have some time left. Um, for, first of all, thank you. Um, my, my question is, um, has the Nigerian community here been of any help to you? That is a very odd question because a lot of Nigerians that are here that I know came and they are still trying to find their feet. The longest is like six years and some of them are not yet US citizens. So there is that sense of community I'm trying to find. But me, I don't stick with my own tribe alone. I feel like community for me is people who are like-minded with me. And LGBTQ people, no matter their skin color, or I find them as community. And LGBTQ community has filled the vacuum of what the Nigerian community would have done for me. That is what I would say. I know you mentioned a few things, and I know we know each other. Um, through some of the work you've done. And um, one of the things I'd like to ask is, there are a lot of things people can do, and I know coming to my mind of people who've stayed with me and so forth, is like use cell phones and things like that. I just wish there was a clearinghouse. Uh, uh, do you know of anyone who's doing things like, here's the things we need that people can contribute to and make, you know, do something to, to help with this? Because there are so many things you need when you, when you, if you've been in detention, which is such a horror that people don't understand, and then bingo, you're out and you know, it's, late at night and you're standing outside what used to be an abandoned warehouse in the middle of nowhere. So I, I always encourage people to act, but like sometimes you can't do everything. And it's overwhelming when you look at it from like everything that could be done. But like at every particular time, there are organizations that are filling one vacuum or the other. There's an organization called Asylum Connect. They create a catalog online of like, if LGBTQ people land in any part of America, if they go to Asylum Connect, they could see in a particular city what kind of resources that are available there. So if you have any resource that you want to add to the catalog, you can connect with Asylum Connect to be able to add to the catalog. Here in New York City, I work with an organization called CBE Refugee Tax Force. It's just a group of Jewish people in Brooklyn that decide to come together to help people set up apartments. They have registered now as Root Refuge. So they, they would send an email in the lister, in the lister self said, oh, this family just came to New York City. They don't have a place to live. We're going to donate furnishers. Anybody that has any furniture that you don't want to use, donate it to us. Volunteers will drive and go and set up the apartment for the person. So you could connect with CBE Refugee Tax Force. They are in Brooklyn. And there are other coalitions like um, New Sanctuary Coalition and other movements. It's always good to tag with an organization. I'm not antagonizing any organization, but like little organizations that are grassroots directly impact the lives of people. Even though you don't want to contribute, first thing is exploration get to know what they are doing. If you get to know what they are doing, you will see strategies that you can employ to help. Um, an another one is uh, the Santa Fe Dreamers Project, which uh, has placed a number of uh, like formerly detained trans folks here in New York. And um, they have, you can go on their site for donations or also just to sign up for potentially actually offering housing for folks. Um, they're doing great work. And yeah, New Sanctuary Coalition as well. Yeah. 
Oh, hello. Um, you mentioned that as a younger kid, you are you were very religious and into your faith. And I'm wondering if after you coming out, um, how you balance your faith with? So I am still a very religious person, but one thing that I realize is that most people grew up with being taught the Ten Commandments, and that is all they know. And I was arguing with a Nigerian. I was like, have you ever read the Quran? So I've been a Christian. I've been a Muslim. I've been a pagan. And now I'm a Unitarian. So one thing I believe is that there's a truth, and there's an atom of truth to every religion. My reverend, Reverend Mary, she is also a member of the LGBTQ community and a reverend. So first is to think about humanity. What would you do as a human before religion? Because religion was taught to us as a way to create a counterintuitive approach to dominate some set of people, to create a godlike figure. I was trained as a Pentecostal preacher on how to manipulate people to give money to the church. So I know deep down inside that everything religion was doing to me was to teach me how to manipulate. So now I'm using those manipulative tactics I've used on people, now on myself, to manipulate myself to understand that God loves me. If I can manipulate other people to do something, I could manipulate myself for good. So I balance it out. I pray to God. I encourage people to pray to God if you believe in God. I still believe that God loves me. How can God create a human being and hate him? That must be a very bad God. And if the God the Bible preaches says is all loving, all enduring, all forgiving, then he has chosen me to be who I am. If you want a private sermon, I'll preach to you. <laughs> Some of us saw you do the play in New York of Bed 26. So talk about, was that such a great experience and are you gonna do something else? Uh, so those of you that have not seen the play, please visit www.edafilboro.com so that you can learn what I'm going to do next. But as regard to the play, it was very interesting because art is a different form of expression. And art, artists believe that the world they are currently living in is not the world they want to live in. So art is a way of expressing your imagination of what kind of world you want to live in. And I decided to do that play because a lot of people hear about asylum seekers, and I've talked about my story severally, but you never felt what I felt as being someone who was persecuted for being gay. You never felt what I felt as being someone who did nothing but was handcuffed and taken to a jail. So that experience for me was very hard. 12 weeks I had to practice every single day to learn my life in a script, to be able to act it out. People that were around me, people that came in during the Briazas would tell you that it was a very difficult experience, but a gold that is dug from the floor is not a good until it is refined through fire. That experience is fire, and it has taught me that acting is not a thing for me, even though I did it well, but what is the next thing that is good for me is what I'm looking for. People always tell me when I was young, follow your passion, follow your passion. And when I follow my passion and it doesn't work, I get disappointed. So now I'm no longer following my passion. I'm following the flow of everything that comes. I try every single thing that comes to my life. I'm 28. If they told me that I would leave everything in Nigeria and start a new life, I wouldn't believe. For me to be able to do that, that means if I decide to be a singer tomorrow with this voice, I could release an album. I choose not to be a singer. It's not like I'm not a good singer. 
So that is the thing I tried with myself to know, explore. Maybe acting would have been for me, but that told me that acting was not for me. That play is going to come out in an HBO documentary next year, so just watch out for it and you are going to see it. Um, it, but we, we're going to get another book out of you, I, I think, right? You're not going to do the revival? No, no. So I'm going, to do, I'm going to do something else. Like I and John, well, I've, been, I've been working on a book that I want to publish, and the idea of the book is me and the people that I worked with to be able to get to where I'm going to, to show people the roadmap of how they too can become an efficient and prolific change maker. It's going to be like how to harness your civic power to create change. Because we all have civic powers that we never utilize. Let me give this last tip. I know our time is over. There are three ways to make change in this world. One is to be rich. When you are rich, <laughs> when you are rich, it's going to trickle down. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation helped with BGC vaccine. That was why I didn't have polio. Two, is to be famous. When you do everything in open, you will reach more people than in hiding. Even though Kim Kardashian is famous for something else, she has created a new culture of people wanting to be social media models. You could make impact by being famous. Three, is to have a strong opinion. If you have a strong opinion like Ben Shapiro, people on the left will hate you. People on the right will like you. People in the middle that are ambivalent, that are not strong enough to make a decision, will either support you or go against you. If they go against you, by hating you, more people will get to know you. So choose one of those three and follow that path. Or maybe all three of that fake, perhaps. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to continue this conversation downstairs. There's going to be a reception um, in the bookstore right below us. So we'll see you down there.